Hey everybody, happy Friday. We made it through another week and I'm really excited to chat with a leader in the innovation economy, uh, the gig economy, talking about the future of work and more with Michael from Torque. How are you, Michael? I'm doing well. Yeah, thanks for uh, having me. Well, thanks for being here. Uh, really intrigued by your startup and your mission. Um, lots of questions before that. Maybe introduce yourself and uh, who is Torque? Yeah, sure thing. So um, uh, quickly, I'm a, I'm a Boston native, um, born, raised, grew up, went to school here. Computer science was my focus um, in college, got into the software industry um, found consulting in, uh, and early in my career, I kind of realized that, you know, this whole, um, this whole talent, uh, industry was, uh, needed some innovation, right? So, uh, I did a lot, um, basically since 2002, that's been the focus of my work is kind of, how do you take what has been, you know, sort of a traditional talent acquisition process, whether you're thinking about consulting, staffing, and direct hiring, and moving that into more of a digital platform experience. Um, Torque is the culmination of a lot of my experiences over you know, the, uh, the past 20 plus years. So we started Torque in, um, in September of 2021. And the whole idea of Torque is um, how do we um, provide access to uh, job opportunities to a global network of freelance contractors. So professional developers, we focus in the software industry, um, and uh, we have a global community of talent that we're constantly growing. So we're going out and finding new talent, we're bringing them into Torque with the promise of giving them job opportunities, giving them career growth opportunities. Um, and then the other side of our model is going out and finding businesses that want access to this uh, this talent that we've collected. Um, and then the middle of it is really a it's the orchestration is done by our technology platform. So, you know, we're we're all pretty familiar with uh, with marketplace models and businesses these days. And uh, that's what Torque is at its core um, from a tech platform perspective. Fantastic. So, um, you know, many of us have become familiar with the gig economy through places like Fiverr and, and Upwork and, and others, um, you know, with mixed results, I'd say. It's, you know, it's really interesting unicorns. But but how do you see yourself in this landscape of gig economy companies? And, you know, what's your unique position there? Yeah. So, um, so it's a little bit more come from my background. My previously, I built a company um, called Top Coder. It's a very successful crowdsourcing business mm. model. Um, maybe a little similar to what what a fiber is like um, in terms of the high transaction volume. Go in, put work out there, get multiple people come in. Um, you know, had a I really had a a great time building that. It was acquired by Wipro. It's still up and running. It's got a. Mm. Um, but one of the things I learned was, you know, in some of these business models, you can lose the connection with that talent. And, um, mm. and you know, we're humans and we want to be connected to the people we're working with and we want to have relationships with them. And there's more than just the work product that gets exchanged when you're working with somebody, um, when you meet somebody. So, you know, Torque. Uh, is a little different from what an Upwork or a Fiverr marketplace would look like, which is very transactional. Um, mm. It's very kind of black box, if you will. Um, and, and short term, you know, could be a number of days or a number of weeks that that engagement would last. Torque's focus is, uh, is really our, so our average engagement size is about six months. Um, and so you, you we're, we're aiming to build longing um connections between our customers and our talent. And so we use a lot of the same dynamics, but our dyna uh, marketplace dynamics um, to find that talent. So that's kind of the core difference. Like we, we run uh, technology assessments. We have things like, mm. you know, events or crowdsourcing challenges, but it's in the, it's in the spirit of how do we identify um, that great talent that exists out there um, globally how do we um, engage them? And how do we find out what they're interested in? And then when we have a need from a customer, we can connect them 
um, and sort of get out of the way and say, hey, you know, you need a, a developer for six months to work on a product. Um, we're going to find you the best fit very quickly, very rapidly from our existing community. Um, so that that's really where we differ from, um, I think, what a, what a Fiverr or a uh, or, or an Upwork would traditionally um, fill. We're, we're doing, I'd say, more um, longer term, um, often more complex um, and higher end uh, type of job requests. Yeah, it sounds in intriguing. And, and tell us, how do the mechanics of your talent sort of network at Torque work? How do you match remote developers with the companies they they work with? Yeah, so um, I'll geek out a little bit in this in this answer, but uh, so um, so here's the experience from a talent perspective. Um, in um, and I'm, you know, as you'd be able to tell, I'm I'm really passionate about making this a a great experience for the talent. So they come to Torque, they kind of you know drink our Kool Aid and say, hey, this might be good for my career. Let's let's become a member. They join the Torque community. There's no charge to the talent. They create a profile. That's kind of step number one. So in your profile creation, um, we pull in. So we're not trying to recreate everything you've ever done in your life and kind of give us all that information. We can pull it from different places. So we have sources that we can get like LinkedIn to get your work history. If you're yeah. a software developer, you'll have um, accounts on platforms like GitHub and and um, and, and hash node and things like that. We can get an API access in to get the metadata from that. So we can say, hey, mm. you know, we can look at what you actually do for the last 12 months on GitHub, right? How many, how many commits did you do? What languages did you work in? Um, you tell us a little bit about yourself, like, hey, what are the things you're interested in? Which skills you have? Um, and then, um, and then uh, we, you can do assessments on our platform. So a lot of things like, okay, great. You said you're good at, at React, right? As a as a software development language, we see in your work yes. history that you had a job where you did React. Now here's an assessment. Show us how good you are versus your peers, um, and we can put all that together. Um, that's the profile. But where it gets interesting is um, how our platform works. We're heavily um, AI, uh, an intelligent platform using AI. So all of that data gets put through um, an AI embedding process, which we basically take all of that, we chunk it up, and we can find out like, okay, hey, if you're, if you're good at Kubernetes, that means you're also good at containers and you're good at you know, these other, these other uh, things that may not be reflected in your profile, may not be reflected in your LinkedIn, may not be reflected in your GitHub stats. So we really create this, um, you know, almost a reverse semantic match of your of your profile to to so all that data goes into a vector database and then mm -hmm. so that that's the entry point for a a, a talent um, we have a lot of other engagements like hey come participate in a project that we're putting out there here's a task that you can do all of it generates more data we put into our vector database um, we also have a, a productivity tool called Codalike. So Codalike is mm. kind of like I'm not wearing my Apple Watch, but if I was, I'd look at you know <laughs> what was my activity for today, what were my move ranks. Codalike gives us uh, it gives a developer like stati statistics and measurement about how often they're in the flow state, how often where they're spending mm. their time. Are they coding? Are they reading code? Are they debugging? Um, how many times are they context switching? And it's just a coach for them. So it's data. Yeah. It's their data. We, we don't use that data. We don't, we don't, uh, we don't publish that data, uh, but it does allow us to understand the strengths of a developer, right? And, and capture more things that we can put into that search criteria. So when we finally do get a job description from a customer, we also parse that, we get the embeddings from it. And then our matching criteria in our vector database is very, very powerful. So we, mm -hmm. can, we can very quickly find talent that can satisfy um, a job request like in seconds, right? And ideally wow. within minutes, within minutes, we can get a set of initial candidates in front of a customer. Um, now they may not be available, but what we try to do is say, hey, let, what about these? Are these the type of resources you're looking for? And if they are, 
then we know that we, hey, we've got the search criteria right. Let's go get the candidates that are ready to apply. Fantastic. Uh, that's quite a tour de force on the tech side. Really interesting. Um, and talk about the world of hybrid teams, hybrid work, remote work, where, you know, you, you focus your attention. I mean, how does how do these tools support a better sort of work culture relationship, you know, is often a challenge in these remote work settings? What have you seen in that regard? And um and how can we improve the, the sort of hybrid work uh, environment? Um, so I have, I, you know, I mean, I work, obviously you can see behind me, I work remotely. Mm-hmm. I've worked remotely since 2013. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, I strongly believe that that's, you know, that's the way to go. Uh, that doesn't mean you need to get, you don't need to get together. Like you still need to have mm. Meetings and you need to have culture and you need to bring people together, but it doesn't have to be a command and control five days per week or even you know Tuesdays and Thursdays. So I think you know I, I heavily believe in the remote remote culture uh, piece of it, and um, and I think what we've seen um, as this remote world has unfolded um, is that people now are they're they're more interested in the type of work they're doing than people may have been in the past. So it's like, well, you know what? I really like doing this. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to focus on doing this instead of in the past where you you show up to the office, you do whatever's on your list for that day. Some of that stuff that you really enjoy, some of it might not be. So I, I think what, I guess what I'm trying to say is we've done a really good job as an industry to create a lot of optionality for workers to be able mm. to choose what they want to spend their time on. Um, we certainly see this in the, you know, small business, size businesses are adopting it where they're, they're comfortable with, Hey, I, I only need this person for 20 hours a week, but it's a really important skill set to me. So they're okay with that hybrid or fractional um, work environment. Um, and that provides power to the talent because they can say, oh, I'm going to do 20 hours over here. I'm going to do 10 hours over here and another 10 hours over here. I think the issue and the opportunity, I can't remember how you phrase it or what we can do better, is that enterprises haven't adopted this enough yet. So enterprises are still looking for, you know, I want you dedicated 40 hours a week, you know, <laughs> in your keyboard, on your Zoom terminal, terminal sitting in your chair. Um, I think as, as enterprises start to catch on, it's going to create more opportunity for these um, hybrid work opportunities. And it's going to be hard to turn, you know, it, it, we're not going to turn back, right? So like, you know, if, if you go back and you look at what did I do for the last three months, maybe it was, five, you know, parts of four or five different project teams, Hmm. And uh, I think that can create a really great worker experience, um, talent experience, but, um, but the industry is just lagging a little bit. Um, so. Great insights. Thanks for that. Um, you know, talk about, you, you, you know, the marketplace globally, you have a really unique perspective on talent worldwide, offshore, onshore here in the U S what what are some of the hot spots and where are you seeing sort of the next generation of uh, software engineering talent coming from? Uh, that's a great question. That's something I've been a student of this um, for a long time. And, uh, and the answer that I would have given you five years ago is different than the one mm. that I will give you today, which I think is cool. Um, so, there's a huge growth of uh, demand for near shore talent and um, versus five years ago, it was either remote or in office. (laughs) Now we've brought in this other dimension, which is called time zone. (laughs) So when, uh, when the pandemic happened and we were all kind of forced to work remotely, um, what became important was whether or not you were in the same time zone, right? It didn't matter if you were 60 miles away or 30 miles away, or 3,000 miles away. But if you're in the same time zone, then we can communicate. We can get on meetings. We can do scrums in the morning. We can, 
Um, so that that dimension became really important to um, the creation of teams. And I think in a certain in a certain degree, it hurt the um, the traditional offshore model, which is you know 10, 12 hours difference from from your your working hours, right? In fact, you're in the US and you're you're working with resources in Asia. It's a big time gap. So uh, the growth happened. I saw it immediately, you know, uh, where in, in, you know, U.S. and Canada, right, which, you know, culturally very aligned, you know, language aligned. Um, but then the explosion in the last few years has been Latin America. So it's been mm-hmm. U.S. based companies looking to get access to resources in Latin America. It's got a great and growing talent base. It's got good educational structure strong engineering, you know, by country, it varies, varies, you know, a little bit, but there's a ton of supply of, um, of talent in Latin America. And, um, and that, that's really where I've seen the most dramatic growth, maybe in my career that if I've, if I look back and I think about where I've seen, um, the talent growth, uh, you know, certainly in the dot-com era, um, Back, you know, before I had any gray hair, <laughs> we had a, we had a bunch of growth of U.S. based resources, and then we had the growth in the uh, India offshore uh, movement. Um, this might be even bigger than both of those. Wow, that's phenomenal! Well, it's it's great to hear. Uh, you talked about AI and vector databases and other technologies in your platform at Torque. Talk about the talent war for. AI, you know, data scientists and other skill sets that are in huge demand, you, you must be getting involved in some quite, uh, you know, interesting projects there. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, yeah, I mean, you can't get into a conversation without talking about <laughs> AI these days. Um, uh, I'll, I'll tell you, I, I, we sort of, um, we sort of watched to see what was unfolding first. Because um, as we saw, you know, I mean, a lot of a lot of your AI engineers are overlap with what a traditional full stack developer or back end developer um, skill set mm. would be, right? In terms of languages and platforms they work on. Um, and so, what what we've seen though in the last six months or so is that it's become instead of this amorphous, "Hey, are you an AI software developer?" which means close to zero. Um, now it's saying, well, okay, hey, do you have um, experience in Python? And mm. do you have any training in prompt engineering, right? And mm. those two things together become a very, a, a skill set that is that, that is in high demand. Um, so it, it's, uh, and that's really what we've started to focus on is like, how can we, um, so number one, identify resources that have those skill sets. But number two, provide opportunities for, if you are a Python developer and you don't understand the concepts behind prompt engineering, here's how you can learn it, right? There's a course on Coursera. It's taught by a professor from Vanderbilt. It's a fantastic course. Mm -hmm. You can learn it in a couple of weeks. So we're starting to grow that capacity of talent. Um, And, you know, I, I think that's where it's heading. And I think, you know, even beyond software developers, it'll be people that have, um, you know, do you have a clinical background, right, in the healthcare mm-hmm. space, and are you trained in prompt engineering, right? So, you know, combine those things together, and we have a really powerful, um, you know, really powerful combination. So um, that's that's currently kind of where I where I see it going. Um, I think there'll be, you know. You know, I think there'll be more. There's going to be more to come in this space. You know, and in a different way of looking at, um, I think the application landscape in terms of how we interface with apps is going to drastically change because we can remove so many of the steps that we would traditionally, you know, take. So I'll give you a quick example of that. If you're looking for, um, you're looking for a candidate, right? Trying to hire somebody, you write a job description. You post that job description, people apply for it. Um, well, with all these advances in AI these days, you can just have a conversation like this and say, hey, I need somebody that has 
you know, three plus years of Python, has um, knows how to use GitHub, has AWS um, guard duty experience, and mm. just through this conversation, fed into an, an AI interpreter, you can immediately match to the talent and skip the entire job description process. Right, we get rid mm. of that job description completely. That's a very simple case, but I think there's a lot of these cases where we can rethink the flow of um of what would traditionally be you know a process that we've become accustomed to wow that's phenomenal really interesting and just as a second part thought on that there's been lots of prognostication about how ai will impact uh, developers coders and so uh, software engineers in general and sort of from apocalyptic <laughs> you know to don't go study computer science to uh well it's going to it's going to create a boom benefiting uh, developers of all kinds. W what's your take on this future yeah, of ours? That's a great question. Um, so uh, I, you know, just, I'm an optimist. I tend to, mm. I tend to look at things with the, with that, you know, that view. Um, and uh, I don't think, I think that the, the demand for software development talent is going to remain. It's going to increase um, there's, there's not been a ceiling on the amount of software development capacity that we can, we have, we, you know, there's no ceiling to that capacity because mm. there's always the next innovation. There's always the next way of doing things. There's always, and, and this isn't from, from this part. Now I've been in the software industry since the late nineties. This isn't the first time we've had a groundbreaking technology that has removed mm. a giant set of activities that a developer had to do, right? When we, you know, new programming languages come out and all of a sudden you don't have to worry about 30% of what you used to have to worry about. A new technology comes out like cloud and now you don't have to worry about servers mm. or, you know, infrastructure or things like that. So although I'd say this is, this is probably a little bit more than those by the same vein, like, all that extra capacity that was theoretically created by giving those, you know, those, that extra productivity to a developer, it was immediately, you know, it was immediately um, sucked up by the demand for new tech, new innovation. Um, so I don't think it's going to go away. I, I would say if you, if you, uh, if you have an inclination for computer science, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Don't change your major kids. Uh, not, not yet. Um, and speaking of talent, do you, do you care to call out any clients, customers, in terms of the impact you were able to make with them, and and maybe the industry you were to help, you know, help in? Uh, without calling out favorite children, you have lots of of customers, but uh, any, any examples? Yeah, um, yeah. So we we have um, our customer base is we have a lot of technology companies, so shopping, mm. right? Um, we have a, a decent amount in financial services and, um, and I, you know, I think when I look at, um, you know, who's been kind of a great example of a customer for us, it's, um, it's a company there's a, in the educational space called school, school status, right? They're a great company. Mm -hmm. They're building a lot of great technology. Um, they are focused in the education space, which has obviously changed dramatically since, uh, since the pandemic. Um, you know, they're, they're fantastic to work with, um, other companies like, uh, all trails, so, you know, mm. you know, one that a lot of people will be familiar with from an application perspective. Um, and I, you know, I call those two out just because they're, um, you know, they're, they're companies where their only constraint in growth is the speed at which they can innovate. And we can help them, you know, we don't solve all of it, but we can help with a piece of that for them. Um, and that's a great alignment when you can find that, you know, win-win relationship between um, between customers. Wonderful. Well, great stories. Uh, so what's next for you? Anything you care to share on the roadmap or what's next in shaping the gig economy over the next year or two? Um, you know, I'm really passionate about, uh, moving away from, uh, I, I feel very strongly in this concept of productivity, um, in that it should kind of replace, uh, you know, traditionally 
we've looked at the number of hours you work or um, kind of tells us what you've produced, right? Um, or how much you should get paid. And in, in, I think that we, we're going to move away from that and it's going to be much more, you know, what's the impact you're having? You know, um, how productive are you as a software developer? And the reason why I'm passionate about that is because, um, you know, a lot of other industries, uh, you know, take it sports or, um, you know, or more of your, um, you know, music or something like that that's more in the arts. You know, when you're really successful, it creates, you get this, op- you get uh, more opportunity. You can earn more. You can, um, you know, kind of become a celebrity in your field. And I would love to see that happen for software developers where we start recognize, recognizing people for their contribution, right? And, um, and I think that doesn't happen in a lot of professions today. And there's a lot of people that are uh, impacting, you know, behind the scenes of a very successful company going from A to Z. And, uh, and I'd love to see um, more emphasis be put on, on what impact people are providing and recognizing them for that. So, uh, you know, not to get up on the soapbox on it, but you're going to see more <laughs> innovations from Torque um, on, uh, on helping to create um, tools that arm developers with uh, productivity information, right? So, how good are how how much impact are they having? You know, where are the areas for them to improve? Um, so that's that's an area that I'm 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 excited about. A oh, wonderful, really fascinating topic. Um, so you've had an amazing career journey. Uh, and care to share any advice to you know younger entrepreneurs, up and coming startup founders within the gig economy or outside on you know? blazing a trail in this space uh yeah so um a long time ago bill joy had a quote that was something around you know no matter which company you are most of the smartest people work for somebody else right (laughs) and uh and i think you you need you know as a entrepreneur as a professional as even somebody that's coming out of college you need to realize that concept applies to the individual too. Um, and what that translates to me is, is find mentors in your career. Um, and when you find a good mentor, never, ever, ever, ever let them go. And, uh, and if you do that, and over time, you know, when you become gray like me, you have a stable of mentors um, that you can go and you can you can talk to and you can rely on. Um, I have one mentor that uh, for the last twelve years we've caught up every six weeks. And, wow! Yeah, you know, we worked together at one point, but and we continue to catch up. And it's uh, so I would say that that would be my biggest advice: is that you know realize that you're not going to know everything, be okay with it. Um, but arm yourself with mentors that you can use to fill in those gaps. Well, fantastic advice. Uh, you know, actually hard to execute on and uh, over decades, but well, well done. Really interesting approach. Uh, what are you looking forward to over the next few weeks, months, any events or travel plans otherwise on your radar? Um, I want the weather to get better in the Northeast. I want to get out in the lacrosse field with the kids. And, uh, and I'm, I'm hoping my travel is light for the, for the next few weeks. <laughs> always, <laughs> always, always a good uh, request. Well, thanks so much, Michael, for joining. Really a fascinating look into this world of work. And uh, onwards and upwards. T- take care. Great. Thank you very much. And thanks, everyone, for watching. Reach out to Torque uh, and uh, look forward to our next chat. Take care.